Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Shearholtz from NASA's Office of Communications here at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Welcome to today's briefing about the status of SpaceX's seventh commercial resupply servicing mission to the International Space Station. SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket experienced a problem after liftoff at 10.21 a.m. Eastern Time. Hans Königsmann, Vice President of Mission Assurance for SpaceX, is leading the investigation. To discuss today's events are, on the phone, Gwen Shotwell, President and Chief Operating Officer at SpaceX, via video conference from NASA headquarters, Bill Gerstenmeyer, Associate Administrator of NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Here in the room with me is Michael Safradini, NASA's International Space Station Program Manager. And joining us by phone is Pam Underwood, Deputy Division Manager at the Federal Aviation Administration's Operations Integration Division. We'll begin with some opening remarks from each participant. We'll then take a few questions. We'll start with reporters here in the room and then media who have joined us by the phone. For those dialed in, when it's your turn to ask your question, please limit it to one. Please state your name and your affiliation and to whom you're addressing your question. To get into the queue to ask a question, please dial star one on your phone. We'll go ahead and begin with Gwen Shotwell. Good afternoon. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, Falcon 9 lifted off today for the seventh uh, commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station at 1021. Um, liftoff was successful. First stage flight was successful. Um, up until 139 seconds into that flight, uh, we experienced uh, an anomaly, an anomaly, excuse me, which led to a failure of the mission. Uh, the uh, we are obviously collecting data uh, right now and will be for the next few hours. Uh, what I can tell you at this point is the first stage flight uh, remained nominal. We do not expect this to have been a first stage issue. Uh, we saw some pressurization indications in the second stage, which we'll be tracking down and, uh, and following up on there. Um, we did receive telemetry from Dragon uh, after the event as well. Uh, so we'll be continuing to monitor all the data that we collect to identify the issue that we experience, fix it, and get back to flight. Just so everybody understands, all the processes, protocols, and procedures were followed with respect to safety. Of the, of the public as well as the mission participants. Uh, we've received no indication and expect no indication of any safety issues at all. So I look forward to your questions and hope to answer any that I can at this point. Thank you, Gwen. We'll now move over to Bill Gerstenmeier. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Gwen. Again, this is a tough day. This is not where I really wanted to be on a Sunday afternoon, but space flight's not easy, as we've described to you before, and, and especially I think this points out the difficulty of and the challenges we face in space flight. And, you know, we started with the orbital loss last fall and had the progress loss uh, several months ago, and now the SpaceX loss. And, and there's really no commonality across these three events other than the fact that it's space and it's difficult to go fly. We're essentially operating systems at the, at the edge of their ability to perform and operate. This is a very demanding environment, requires tremendous precision and tremendous amount of engineering skill and, and hardware to perform exactly as it should. Uh, the SpaceX team and the ISS team performed extremely well today. They did everything exactly right. They continued to stay focused. They continued to monitor the ascent. Uh, they continued to monitor activities and make sure that there was no impacts to the public or to anyone else. Uh, the space station crew is fine on orbit. Again, through a testimony to the space station team, they've done a tremendous job of balancing all the consumables on orbit. We're in good shape from a food standpoint, from, from a water standpoint. We need to watch a multi-filtration bed that purifies water. There was a replacement bed on this flight, and we'll have to watch the water levels, and Mike and his teams will do that. Again, this is a, a blow to us. We lost a lot of important research equipment on this flight. Uh, we lost the, uh, the uh, IDA, the docking adapter that we had planned to, to set us up for later. Again, we'll be able to recover from that. We lost a spacesuit.
institute uh, again we'll we'll see how we can recover from that and we lost a lot of research so again it's a it's a pretty uh, important loss to us or it's it's i don't want to minimize the loss to us but again from a macro level standpoint the crew's in no danger we're moving forward the teams are, are ready to support mike can fill you in on the details when he gets a chance to talk here in a minute and and show you that, that we're in good shape but again the teams have really prepared for this event you know we have a progress launch scheduled on july 3rd i intend that that launch will occur on time uh, we've reviewed that flight in detail we understand the differences uh, associated with that flight from the recent progress failure they've essentially replaced the uh, third stage of the rocket with an older configuration that's flown with progress before mike and the teams have reviewed that in detail the engineering teams at nasa have reviewed that so we're ready to go with the progress flight on july 3rd we have an upcoming Soyuz flight with crew at the end of the month, end of July, uh, July 23rd. We're still working through that flight readiness process. We'll continue to review that. I don't anticipate that flight uh, being impacted by this event, by the loss of the SpaceX flight, but we still have some work ahead of us to go ahead and make sure that the progress flight loss didn't couple into the crew flight. So we still have some open work there. We have not done yet our flight readiness review, but this loss will not impact the crew flight. Then there's a Japanese flight later in the summer, and then there's an orbital flight towards the end of the year. And so Mike and the teams will look at all those and figure out the right way to, to manifest things and move things around. We have sufficient research. We have sufficient consumables on orbit that the crew is safe and things are fine. So again, from a macro level standpoint, uh, this is uh, you know, what we anticipated. You know, I think I've talked to you before about, you know, we expected through the commercial cargo program we would lose some vehicles. Um, I did think we would lose them all in, in a one year time frame, but we have. I think it just there's no negligence here. There's no, uh, you know, really problem with this. It just shows the challenges that we have facing engineering and and the challenges of spaceflight in general. So the teams will work through this. We'll learn from these events, and I think we'll we'll get stronger from these events. We'll understand what occurred. We'll understand where there were engineering weaknesses. We'll get a chance to see these. The teams will learn from these. They'll take that learning forward. They'll get back ready to go fly, and we'll go back flying again. So the important thing is we, we stand down just long enough to understand the failure, to internalize the learning, and to move forward. So, again, an unfortunate event, but I think it's important for all of us to realize that, that through these failures and through these events, we can learn more and we can come back stronger and we can get prepared to really keep pushing uh, the envelope as, as we move into space. You know, it's not easy living on the frontier of space. It's not easy taking care of space station. I think sometimes folks think it's easy and, and, it, and it seems routine, and that's when we get in trouble. It is not easy and it is not routine. The evidence of these last three flights have really shown us uh, the, the problems that can occur, but it also shows the resilience. If a team's plan ahead and they work ahead, they can be ready to go support. So again, I look forward to your questions. And again, I want to thank the teams for the excellent work today, for being focused, they're doing the right things from a safe safety standpoint and, and making sure the public was okay and making sure that the space station crew on orbit stayed in good shape. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, Michael Safferdini. I don't have a whole lot to add to what uh, Bill just said. Uh, it is a disappointing loss. Uh, however, uh, we uh, managed the International Space Station to uh, be able to uh, get through these types of incidents, as Bill said. Um, we've always assumed that uh, we would lose a vehicle every so often. Uh, space flight is very hard. Getting to low Earth orbit is extremely challenging. And it does, uh, it does challenge the systems uh, that fly into low Earth orbit every time they go. Uh, so we expect that. Of course, having, uh, having three uh, this close together is uh, not what we'd hoped for. Um, however, fortunately, we had put ourselves in a position prior to even the orbital flight we had quite a bit of logistics on board to support the crew, and that's helped us uh, through this period and, and will continue to help us through uh, this next challenge. Uh, on board uh, this particular vehicle uh, was the docking adapter that we talked about uh, pre-launch and, um, and the comm system associated with that. Uh, the good news is we have um, a second docking adapter, and, a, and a two, we, ultimately the radio system has two radios. And so we only flew one each on this flight, uh, and so those are available. So uh, we will be able to continue to press towards uh, the docking system on board ISS and to support the commercial crew program when they come online. 
Um, in addition to that, uh, we have, uh, as Bill said, the progress fix and apply will have a lot of uh, crew logistics, food and water and uh, provisions. Uh, they're trying to get their uh, supplies back up to a higher level, and so that in turn will drive um, the logistics up for the entire ISS. And so uh, that's in pretty good shape. So as Bill said, when you look forward uh, from a logistics standpoint, uh, you have the HTV vehicle, which we'll talk to our JAXA colleagues about any adjustments we need to make there. We have the orbital flight, which was due in December. We might be able to pull that up a little bit. Um, we will be able to continue to crew at six. We will provide provisions on board. But in addition to that, I still expect to fly quite a bit of research and keep the research going. And this is, this is challenging for those folks that fly with us. We have been working very hard to get the external community to uh, understand that ISS is available and the things you can do on board ISS. And so I know this loss is a big deal. You know, we had quite a few student experiments uh, on this flight. And, uh, and so I know that's a, that's a significant impact to them. And it'll be a, it'll be a challenge for them. Uh, this loss will, will certainly be a challenge for them. But you know, this is also a learning experience for, for those students and for all of us. It's, it's, you know, it's not whether you stumble or fall. It's whether or not, it's what you do after you stumble and fall that's going to define uh, success and greatness. So, so we will all pick ourselves up. We'll watch the SpaceX team, I'm sure, sort through this anomaly and figure out the cause and get back to flying. Uh, meanwhile, we're in, a, we're in a good position on board ISS in terms of, of um, continuing to house the crew, uh, continue to protect the schedule going forward, continue to do research. Without a doubt, we have lost some research hardware that we'll have to recover. We've clearly lost uh, some significant hardware for ISS that we'll have to, uh, uh, to, have to recover at, uh, at some point. Uh, and we'll do that. And we'll get on with, uh, with flight in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station. Um, so, so this is a big loss. I don't want to under, underplay that. But I do want everyone to know that as a, as a program, we are, we manage this in a way to keep us healthy. And, uh, and we'll uh, pick ourselves up and get onto the next flight and, and continue to do research on board ISS. Uh, so as the next few weeks go by and we learn a little bit about what, uh, what SpaceX figures out um, from the cause uh, and uh, what our other options are on our other vehicles, we'll, we'll let folks know how we adjust. But we will, we will, you can expect that we will adjust some of our uh, flights here in the future to, to make sure that we have all the supplies we need on board ISS. But we will continue to do research during that period as well. And that's uh, all I have for now. Thank you. We'll now go back to the phones where we have Pam Underwood from the FAA. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, for, for everyone's awareness, this activity was being conducted under an FAA launch license. So according to the information that we currently have, um, this is being classified as a mishap. That means that going forward, the investigation will be conducted, the mishap investigation will be conducted by SpaceX with FAA oversight. We currently have safety inspectors that are uh, on site right now and monitoring the activities. We will continue this um, as SpaceX continues to work through their investigation. That's all we have from the FAA at the present time, but I do look forward to any questions that uh, some may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we'll take some questions here in the room first, and then we'll get to the questions on the phone. Again, if you want to ask a question on the phone, please dial star one to get into the queue, and please limit your question to one each. State your name, affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. Uh, we'll start here in the room with Irene Klotz. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Irene Klotz with Reuters. Um, for Gwen, um, you guys have been pushing really hard to uh, get your launch rate up and also recently had that huge success of getting certified for Air Force flights. Um, can you talk a little bit about what impact you think this might have and if there's anything kind of at first brush that you can see was done differently for this flight that you've done um, for your 18 successful previous flights? Thanks. Sure, Irene. Um, there's 
nothing that stands out as being different uh, for this particular flight uh, that we've done for other flights. Um, I don't want to speculate as to uh, what it's going to take to get back to flight because we don't yet know. Uh, we haven't pinpointed exactly what happened yet. However, we're certainly in an extraordinary position uh, to know what happened, to find what happened, uh, to fix what happened, and to get back to flight, given the fact that the majority of this launch vehicle and all its components are ours, so we don't have to go through legal and contracts negotiations and discussions to get data on any components. We own it all. Uh, I'm sure we'll find it rapidly, and, uh, and we'll get back to flight as soon as we safely and reliably can. By the way, I did want to extend a thanks to all the folks at uh, NASA and the Air Force. Everybody's reached out offering help, uh, and I, I certainly wanted to acknowledge that and thank everybody. And we'll certainly take you up on it if, uh, if we can leverage that. Okay, thanks. James Dean? Thanks, James Dean, Florida Today. Uh, Gwen, can you tell us how this event will might, might affect your uh, progress moving forward with commercial crew? And are you concerned about it shaking people's confidence in, in that strategy? So as uh, both Bill and Mike mentioned, uh, this is a tough business. Uh, any launch provider has to have uh, considered this in their operational plans uh, going forward. So I don't anticipate this to impact any program that we have ongoing. We must find the cause of the failure. We must fix it. Uh, and obviously, we're going to get back to flight. Um, we'll also, it's, it's a reminder, it's, a, it's not a great reminder, but it's a reminder nonetheless of how difficult this is, and we will pour even more effort into looking at every other possible source of issues uh, in, in the future. Uh, we don't want to have dodged a bullet in the past and then uh, only to get bitten again. So um, this uh, doesn't change our plans. Uh, our customers have always been loyal. Uh, we, we let them see how we operate. They're very confident in our technical team and our operations team. So um, it's, a, it's a hiccup. It's a, certainly a time to take, uh, to pause, and uh, make sure we're doing everything we need to do. But, uh, but no, I don't anticipate any significant changes. And we have some additional comments from Mr. Gerstemeyer. Yeah, I'd just like to add that, uh, again, one of the advantages of the overall program is, you know, we can learn from this event on cargo. Well, although it's unfortunate, it's still recoverable. And, and we can understand what occurred with the SpaceX team. And this information can be really important as we move forward into the crew uh, designs and flights. So we can understand if there's a, a problem or a concern, uh, what occurred. And when we get that data, we'll see if it impacts crew. But it gives us a chance to learn in a, an environment where we can tolerate a little more more risk that's in the cargo environment and then apply that into the crew environment. So again, I think this shows the overall strength of the strategy we have moving forward. It's good to gain experience with the providers in, uh, in an, an environment where you can take a little risk and understand, but then if a failure occurs, you can then learn from that failure and make sure that it doesn't occur and take it out of the crew program before you get to the crew program. So I don't think this really impacts much our, our strategy for crew, but I think it also shows us how by continuing to fly, we can learn from these flights and, and learn things and learn hard lessons and apply them to crew and make sure we're really ready and really safe when it's time to go fly crew to space station. Hey, Morgan Spurlock, CNN. Um, I think today does reinforce everyone not only how difficult but potentially dangerous space travel can be. So, Bill, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. Do you see this impacting the timeline that you have for the crew transport program? You know, right now the current timeline is 2017. Um, I understand that, you know, you do look at this as a chance to learn from what happened today, but right now we're two years out. Do you think that timeline will be affected? Again, I think it's a it's too early to really uh, make those uh, those discussions about what is if it's going to affect the timeline or not. I don't anticipate it'll affect the timeline, and and we'll understand what the failure was when we see what the failure is. We'll see if it impacts, but this learning can actually you know, kind of expedite things. We can actually learn from this failure, understand a weakness or a flaw in the design that we might not have seen for a while, and so this could maybe you know actually lower some of the uh, speculation about how we want to move forward and how we want to work on the crew design. So at this point, I don't think there's any impact at all to the overall 
crew uh, development timeline through the December 2017 kind of uh, activity, and then we'll keep moving forward with that. But I think the first thing is we'll let the SpaceX team and the FAA team and the NASA team take a look at this failure, understand what occurred, and then take that learning and apply it directly to crew. And, and at this point, I don't anticipate it impacting the schedule. In fact, it, it could help us to, to nail down designs and move forward. We'll take another question in the room, then go to some of the questions on the phone. Thank you. Daryl Nail, Fox Orlando. Mike, get your reaction about the students who had experiments going on this flight that were destroyed in Wallops, Virginia, then rebuilt them, and then had them destroyed again in Cape Canaveral here. Well, and I tried to touch on that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's also true um, for all of us, right? So these, these uh, young people are learning um, a valuable lesson, I think, that not only is going to certainly apply in spaceflight, but it applies in life as well, that that you do have setbacks, um, but, uh, you, you know, they, they can be recovered from. You just keep trying. We we have the same thing. We've, uh, uh, on on uh, Orb 3 and on uh, this flight, we had crew provisions that, uh, that oh, no, so on Orb 3 on, and on the progress flight we had crew provisions for uh, the upcoming crew that have both been, both been lost and those are relatively inexpensive and we'll fly those again uh, we had uh, multi-filtration beds for water processing uh, that we've lost on the orbital and on on this flight now that's that's a setback for us um, but as I said it's really what you do um, after you've had to face adversity that really defines um, what you're going to uh, be able to do, and I think that's a really important lesson for these kids. So we'll we'll help them uh, get back online. We'll help them with their uh, getting their hardware built again, uh, and we'll get them to orbit, and we'll do their experiments, and uh, and hopefully um, this will be a positive lesson for them in the end. But it's it's a big impact, and it's hard on them. I know because it's hard on me. <clears throat> okay, uh, our first uh, question on the phone is from Alan Boyle of MSNBC. Thank you. I guess this would be a question for Pam, perhaps for Gwen, and uh, it has to do with the FAA role in the investigation. Uh, does this mean that SpaceX would have to stand down from uh, all future Falcon 9 flights, or can those proceed? Uh, what would the timeline generally be for this sort of investigation, and will the FAA have to sign off before, uh, before the next step is taken, whatever that is? Thank you. How about if I start? This is Gwen, and I'll have uh, Pam pick up uh, the remaining. So given this is a, a, a mishap, SpaceX, uh, per our license, SpaceX is in charge of the anomaly investigation. We will obviously leverage uh, the help and support of the FAA, as I mentioned earlier, NASA, and the Air Force as well. Um, once we do identify the issues, uh, we will submit uh, that documentation to uh, the FAA, and it will be considered uh, prior to the next flight. Uh, I don't have a timeline for that right now. Um, I, it certainly isn't going to be a year. Um, I imagine uh, a number of months or so, but uh, again, I don't want to speculate. Um, Pam, is there anything I missed? No, Gwen, thank you. Um, I completely agree with everything you said. Being conducted under an FAA license, SpaceX will have the responsibility to um, inform us, give us a, a, a report, a final report of their findings. Of course, we'll be participating and overseeing the um, uh, mishap investigation along the way, as SpaceX has already told us that they would do in their license application. So um, I think you framed it up well, process going forward, and I, too, can't speculate on time frame. You know, the, the, the important thing is that this investigation is done proper, and um, going forward, uh, we look forward to working with SpaceX on that. Next question also is from the phone, Seth Borenstein from the Associated Press. Yes, thank you for doing this. I guess this is for Gerst more than anyone. Can you expand a little on the thinking of why at the moment you're not looking at delaying, again, the July crew uh, launch? I mean, given you that you've had three consecutive supply uh, failures, what would it take to make you uh, decide to uh, that it's safe to launch or Alternatively, what would make it uh, you decide that it needs to be delayed? Thank you. 
again, I'll start the the res response, and then I think Mike can add some some details on top of it. Again, I think when we look at the overall uh, consumable standpoint on station, we're good from a from a food and water standpoint, basic. Uh, basic living supplies. We also have a good amount of research on orbit. And in fact, we're kind of uh, in a situation where we could actually benefit from additional crew being on orbit. There's a shortage of research time available for our, our, uh, our crews to, to actually perform. So there's not enough crew members on orbit that with enough hours in the day to actually do the research that we've got there. So there's actually an advantage of us getting the crew up there and increasing the crew size back to six and getting back to the research tempo because we're in space to do something and that's to do research. So I think at this point we don't see a need to slip it. Um, there's the supplies are adequate on orbit. The the food is there, and the research to be done needs to be done. So I think there's still a compelling need to move forward. Now the only thing I would add is that we still need to go through the flight readiness review process. We still need to understand the progress failure that occurred, and we need to make sure that that progress failure doesn't cross over into the Soyuz launch vehicle that launches crew. And that review is still in front of us. Mike's got some reviews scheduled in. Uh, the middle part of July, I have some reviews right after his, and then we'll head up to the launch on the 23rd. But from an overall space station standpoint, it seems prudent to just keep moving forward and keep doing what we're supposed to do in space, and that's to do the research. And I think it's really important for the space station. We're really learning a lot now, and, and we're really starting to turn a, a new page in doing research and providing data back to folks here on the Earth. So we need to keep doing that and keep moving forward. So I'll, I'll see if Mike wants to add anything else. Well, I would just add, like Gerst, I mean, we fly space station not not just to study the human's ability to survive in a microgravity environment uh, in preparation for exploration, which is very important, but we're there to do research uh, across the board. Uh, and uh, so, therefore, uh, the question we ask ourselves every day is, is, is the system able to support the crew? Uh, if the system's able to support the crew, then we then we get on with doing the job at hand, which is research. So the system is well able to support the crew, as I told you beforehand. We have been to well into October, probably late October, if nothing else flew. Uh, we have uh, plenty of opportunity for resources to come to ISS to keep the crew uh, going, and uh, and and so therefore we should continue because without the crew then we can't get our logistics vehicles there with a limited crew we have a very difficult time doing some of the repairs we have to do to keep the systems going so we can do the research we are not in a position today to uh, to stand down on crew flights in fact we're quite healthy on orbit um, and but we're always in a safe position if the time comes and we decide we don't have the logistics to support the crew we always have a vehicle there that can bring them home safely, and we would certainly do that. But we're not even close to that kind of conversation today, given the logistics we have on board. We'll take one more question on the phone, then come back to the room. Uh, Ken Chang of the New York Times. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, I, Elon tweeted that it looked like it was an overpressurization in the second stage oxygen tank. And it looked like there was two events. There was a cloud and then a disassembly. I was wondering if you can provide any more details. I'm sorry, I don't have any more data than that. Um, I've got teams of folks looking at every possible uh, telemetry, or every possible piece of telemetry and data. Um, I just I don't want to speculate as to what happened. We did have, as I mentioned in my opening, we did have a pressurization event on the second stage. Uh, we don't yet know root cause of that. Um, so th that's all we've got. Sorry, Elon tweeted it. That's all I know. Okay, question here. Uh, Jason Ryan from SpaceFlightInsider.com. Earlier this month, the Senate Appropriations Committee voted to uh, cut the commercial crew budget, and I was hoping either Gerst or maybe Mike could ask the question, answer the question of whether or not this might play for those members who made this vote, uh, give them uh, argument, basically ammo for their argument. Yeah, I can take a shot at that and, and try to answer. Again, I think it's really important in this business that um, we keep moving forward. And, and so when I look at the, the budget situation, we really need full funding for crew. Um, there's a technical problem and then there's a financial problem. And I can guarantee you that if 
what we're trying to do is very, very difficult technically, and, and you've seen that through the losses of three spacecraft from three different providers, you know, from, from Orbital, from the Russian government, and then now from SpaceX. That shows you how difficult this technical problem is, and we really need funding at the level, level we requested at to let that technical work keep moving forward. When we get cut back in funding, then that slows down the technical work or compresses the amount of technical work that needs to be done in the amount of time. And we want to get a redundant capability to deliver crew to space as soon as we can get that so we're not solely dependent upon the Russians. So we need that funding at the level we've requested so we can get that work moving forward. If we don't get the funding, we can't do the technical work. The technical work gets delayed or compressed, and this environment is not conducive to letting us compress or delay technical work. We need the time to work the technical items. We need the time to work the, the difficult uh, engineering problems in front of us, and to do that, we need the funding at the levels we needed. So we need to fund at that right level between the, the funding and the technical work work to match them, and, and the plan that we've provided um, through the, the budget process is what we need in 16. We need that full funding to keep the technical work moving forward. It's not right to delay from a funding standpoint and think you'll catch up later technically. We really need to keep moving forward technically, and to do that, we need the funding level we requested. Thank you. Next question over here. Uh, Dan Billow from WESH TV. Uh, I'd like to address uh, my question both to Gwen Shotwell and Bill Gerstenmeyer and request uh, an answer from both of you on this, if I may. Uh, was a destruct signal uh, sent from the ground or received by the launch vehicle after the uh, initial breakup began? I don't believe there was a destruct signal, uh, but I will follow up on that. Um, I've heard no indication that there was a, a destruct signal. Okay, we'll take one more in the room and then go back to the phone. Hi, Robert Perlman with CollectSpace.com uh, with a question for Michael Suffredini. Um, given that you do have a progress going up on Friday, is there anything from this flight, uh, a replacement part from this flight, or anything um, of priority that you would try to rush to Florida to get on board if that is a possibility? And there was mention at the start of a water filtration issue on, on the station um, that you were flying a replacement bed. Uh, is that something that you might want to get on the station sooner? And can you give a few more details about what that issue is? Sure, I can address both. Uh, like I said, the, the, our Russian colleagues have loaded the progress up with food and water and other crew provisions, um, and uh, and that's really very important to us uh, as a collective. And so for us, they're, they're in good shape. Um, I can't think of anything uh, off the top of my head that is so important that we'd want to rush it uh, to our Russian colleagues. Um, I'm certain, sure we'll talk about it here in the next few hours, see if there's anything there we'd like to do. It would have to be small, but overall we're in very good shape on orbit, and so um, there's nothing I can think of right now that that we'd want to go get on the on the progress at this point. Um, to answer your question about water uh, filtration, yes, on orbit um, we have a water filtration system and we monitor its uh, capability by um, checking the water constituents on a regular basis. Uh, the multi filtration beds we have in the water processor today are starting to get full. Uh, as indicated by the measurements we've been taking lately. Um, when it starts to get full, we take water samples and bring them home to understand uh, specific, specifically what the constituents are. The constituents in the water um, are not um, a risk to the crew at the levels that, that we see today. Um, so we are reaching the limit where we would say we'd stop using the water processor. Um, I expect that we have some flexibility in that uh, number, and we'll be working that over the next little while because we know what the constituents are specifically that are um, making the uh, total organic um, number go up uh, higher. Um, and so I expect we have some more runtime left on that uh, the water processor. Uh, if we don't use the water processor, we actually the water situation is uh, about like the food. It can last a little bit longer than the food. Uh, so if we have no water processor at all, we're, we're okay on water as well. Uh, the HTV itself is uh, loaded heavily with water, so we'll get quite a bit when the HTV shows up. And uh, again, the progress is bringing up water. 
Unfortunately for us, this was the second set of multi-filtration beds that we lost, and uh, we we just don't have that fast of a pipeline. So the uh, the team is off building up the next set of, of uh, multi-filtration beds. Uh, I doubt very seriously we'll have them ready in time for the um, August flight of the uh, HTV, um, but we'll work it really hard and see how quickly we can get them to orbit. But again, the situation, like I said, is um, we're, we're in good shape because we store quite a bit of process water on board as well uh, to protect for this, uh, this particular anomaly. We'll go to another question on the phone from Frank Boring of Aviation Week. Uh, thank you. This is for Bill Kirstenmeyer. You, you have redundant capability to get to the station with cargo, but both of your vehicles are down now. Could you give us an update on the uh, return to flight of the other vehicle, the uh, 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 Fordville ATK vehicle, both in terms of its upcoming mission on Atlas and then returning to flight on the Antares? Thank you. In terms of uh, Orbital and ATK, uh, we've been working pretty extensively with uh, with them, and they've worked very well with the uh, United Launch Alliance to get on the Atlas V for this fall. Um, as Mike said uh, earlier in this press uh, conference, that they're currently scheduled in December. Um, again, the launch manifest uh, kind of compressed us into December. We'll work with United Launch Alliance and work with Orbital ATK and see when the right time to fly that flight is. If we can advance a little bit from December and the manifest lets us do that, we might want to do that maybe as early as October. We'll work with the teams to, to see and, and ready to go fly. And again, there's been very good technical progress between Orbital ATK and United Launch Alliance. There's a, an adapter that they had to uh, complete. There's some couple of loads analysis, uh, some modal analysis they needed to do with the, with the uh, Cygnus on top of the Atlas V, and then that's moved along fairly well. Um, again, we're making pretty good progress for uh, Orbital ATK returning to flight on, uh, on an Antares. Um, the engine work has been completed in Russia. The, the Orbital ATK team has picked a new engine for that rocket, the RD-181. Um, the pad repairs are going well at Stennis, or excuse me, at, uh, at Wallops. Um, and that activity has uh, occurred very well, and the, the pad is repair is coming along, and we should support some test flights probably towards the end of this year, or a test firing of the uh, Antares rocket with an anticipation that the Antares rocket probably comes back to flight sometime next spring. So again, I think that the teams have done uh, you know, a remarkable job of working together. There's been a lot of resourcefulness shown uh, for the uh, orbital team to, to go look and find another launch vehicle and to, to reach out to United Launch Alliance. And because of their experience in flying satellites on a variety of different uh, launch vehicles, they were able to show that they could put the Cygnus on top of an Atlas V and get ready to support this fall. So, you know, we didn't uh, know how important it would be for them to return and add redundancy back in our cargo uh, resupply chain. But but it turns out that, again, their creativity and working with uh, other providers to get another launch vehicle will turn out to be, I think, very beneficial to us. So again, I think you can see the, the benefit of this strategy of where we have multiple providers, we have robustness, and then it also shows the um, ingenuity and the, uh, the cleverness of the teams to work together to overcome problems. So again, I think as you've heard through this press conference, these events are hard for us. Um, failure is not easy. It is not easy watching things not go right. Um, every launch is a, is a risk to us, but but again, the, the exciting thing is when you see the teams overcome this failure, learn from this failure, put it for behind them and actually improve and get better, that's the way that things work better. So again, the overall ATK orbital plan looks solid with a flight potentially this fall and then return back to Ontario's uh, next spring. Okay, next we have a reporter from space.com on the phone. Yes, thank you. Um, I guess for uh, Bill and Mike, uh, can you give us specific time frames on uh, through when is the crew on the ISS supplied and with the uh, progress supply mission coming up, uh, how far will uh, that, how far will those supplies extend that date? Uh, let's see. Uh we use uh, very specific dates when we start talking about uh, food and water and and logistics and uh, so we show a date in October but um, 
the way we consume food, the way we consume water, and the conservative we put conservatism we put in our numbers, we could go to the end of October. Uh, I would expect that the progress will probably add about a month to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have Eric Berger from the Houston Chronicle on the phone. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thanks so much for doing this on, uh, on short notice. Question for Gerst. Uh, given some of the congressional skepticism about SpaceX and the budget shortfalls that you addressed earlier regarding commercial crew, does this in any way push NASA closer to a leader follower model in terms of crew flights to the station, or are you confident you can press forward with, with two options? Again, I mean, if you go back to our original uh, philosophy of why we chose two to begin with, um, I think that philosophy is still sound. Um, it's it's really important to have uh, two developers uh, working for the crew capability at the same time in parallel. Um, the leader follower, that negates the benefit of having the two operating in parallel. And again, I think it's, it's very difficult to pick a winner in this situation or to pick the one that has the technical advantage over the other. You know, as you can see through these three failures, here's, again, as I stressed to you before, here's three separate entities, all of which have experienced a failure, a very different failure, but they've all experienced failures. And who would have ever predicted that we would have lost these three vehicles in this particular order? And to do a leader follower, you have to have enough ability to forecast to predict who is the real leader and who's the follower with certainty. And I think this the events of these three losses shows us the, how difficult this environment is and how difficult it is to make that prediction. So this approach we have of having the two providers working essentially or two developers working in parallel, the, the Boeing CST-100 and the, the Dragon, that is the right approach and we need to stay with that approach if we want to have ultimate success for commercial crew. Take another question from here in the room. Hi, Stephen Clark, uh, Space Flight Now. A couple of questions, one, from, one for Mike. Um, Dragon is your only vehicle to get down uh, significant down mass. Uh, uh, can you talk about that side of it? Uh, is there a lot of research on board, uh, things you need back to repair, look at? Uh, how does this impact that? And also maybe for Gwen, uh, has there been any debris recovered, or is there an effort to uh, survey the ocean for any debris th that you might be able to fish out? Thanks. Let's see, I'll do the first. Uh, we One of the big things we worry about is our freezers getting full. Fortunately, SpaceX 6 uh, just recently departed uh, and uh, just about emptied their freezers for us. So from that aspect, we're in, we're in pretty good shape. I haven't looked to, to see the the levels of as how, much, how fast we're going to fill them up and when we're going to get full. Certainly, that'll be one of the things we look at uh, because of that unique capability. Um, we do have some... Uh, hardware that we uh, want to bring home at some point, but none of it's critical. Again, SpaceX 6, uh, we had uh, filled up. In fact, uh, SpaceX 7, we were going to bring trash home on because we we just didn't have that much uh, hardware to return. So in that, from a return standpoint, we're, we were in pretty good shape this flight, and uh, which tells you that overall on orbit, we're in pretty good shape. And that uh, that will be one of the things we look at when we start looking at our projections is when we need the next uh, SpaceX. And a big driver will be what you said is to get some uh, some of the research home. Another question for Gwen? Yeah, I think there was a follow-up to me with respect to recovery. Um, we did have a number of vehicles out there uh, deployed to um, – for the recovery of the possible recovery of the first stage, we also had other assets out there looking um, at the flight. So we've deployed, redeployed them to what we believe to be the landing location. And if there is anything, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to, uh, if there is any debris, we'll try to bring it back. Obviously, uh, anything that's found could be helpful in the investigation. So um, we, we obviously want to retrieve anything we possibly can. Uh, I don't have any word yet. Uh, we had a meeting just about an hour before this press conference, and we've got another technical discussion in about another hour. Uh, I'll know then whether we've uh, 
arrive at the, at the site and see if uh, there's anything visible uh, from which to go and try to recover. So uh, you'll hear from us. Uh, Elon's pretty far, leans pretty far forward in the tweets. Uh, what I do want to state again is that we're, we're not going to speculate. Uh, we're not going to give information early only to have to kind of pull it back and say, nope, it wasn't that, it was something else. So uh, I appreciate everybody's patience in our releasing data. We want to get you the information that is accurate. Ken? Hi, Ken Kramer from Universe Today and Northeast Astronomy Forum. I was, I was also interested in um, the recovery as one question. Are you giving that a very high priority to recover debris as a way to uh, aid the investigation? And for uh, Mike or, or, or Bill, uh, what is the ability to replace this IDA, and do you need two of them before you launch commercial crew, or is just having one of them uh, sufficient? Thanks. Yeah, I'll let Gwen answer first, and then I'll answer your second question. Yeah, Ken, so all the assets that we had available in the area, we've deployed to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the landing site. Uh, it certainly is a priority. Whether you find something that's going to be helpful or not is, is unclear, but uh, certainly um, if there's something there, we do want to pick it up and, and examine it. Absolutely. It, it could be very helpful. And to answer your question about Ida, so we have two. Uh, the second one was going to fly on SpaceX 9. Uh, our plan, our overall plan, is to uh, to have two uh, docking ports and go back to what we call direct handover, where where the replacement crew shows up while the other crew's still on orbit, and then they hand over to each other for about a week or so, and then the other goes home. Uh, but that's not mandatory, and so uh, if if by the time the commercial crews start vehicles start to fly regularly to ISS, uh, we need to. That will be our path until we get a second uh, Ida up there. We have parts uh, for a, for a third Ida, and so we'll go look to see how quickly we can uh, assemble that. Our next question comes on the phone. Jerrica Duncan from CBS Evening News. Hi, I just had a, a question about the cost. Can you give us an estimate of just how much money it took to launch uh, the Falcon 9 rocket? Uh, we actually don't uh, talk about costs um, publicly. Um, so, so no, I, I don't have an estimate for the cost. I think there was a... Uh, okay, we'll take one on the phone. Keith Cowing? Uh, yes, Keith Cowing. I have a question for Mike Safferdini. Um, I was thinking back to my days in station when we were talking about logistics and the whole idea of skip cycle came up where you could endure, I guess it was two quarters, about six months of, you know, bad news, and then have another perhaps quarter sitting there. Are you roughly in that, still doing that sort of thing? And if so, where are you sort of in that um, nice-to-have zone where you don't really worry about getting worried about not having logistics? Yeah, Keith, we've evolved a little bit from there, but uh, we try to protect about six months of time on orbit. Uh, and what that means is uh, if you have no um, means to get supplies up at, at about 45 days before you get to zero, that's when we uh, get into the process of planning the return of the crew. And uh, so today we're at about, give or take, about four months uh, as I mentioned in the pre-launch press conference, uh, we're trying to get that back up to six, but we're also trying to do research at the same time, and so we're balancing that. Our plan was to be up to six by roughly the end of this year. Uh, we'll go look to see what we can end up doing when uh, when the dust settles. But uh, so we're about four months today, and um, and per the guidelines that we follow. If we approach uh, the month and a half period and we don't have a logistics vehicle uh, coming in the near term, even if we do, we'll start the planning uh, for the return of the crew. Um, and uh, certainly if we didn't see any vehicles on the horizon today, uh, we would be considering whether or not to, to fly the, the three crew that we have ready to go. But again, that's not the position we're in. We have four months of supplies on board, so we'll fly the crew. We have two or three vehicles lined up to come fly to ISS. Um, and so I would expect us to uh, to continue to operate um, nominally, uh, although we have some work to do now to recover some of the hardware and and uh, and get some spares on board that we need. 
We'll take a couple more in the room, then go back to the phones. I think there's one here. Yeah, uh, I'm Anya with RT America. My question is for Durst. Uh, you mentioned uh, the need for more federal funding to reduce what you said was a dependency on Russia. I'm wondering if you could explain what your concerns are when it comes to that dependency. Yeah, what, when I say dependency, you know, we only have a single crew provider to space station, and and again, as you can see, we we benefit by having dissimilar redundancy. So it's it's very nice to have multiple providers to to provide a capability to provide a need for uh, for a particular activity. So we would like to have a U.S. provider to augment the Russian uh, crew transportation uh, capability to and from station. So that's what I meant by. Uh, the fact that I wanted to uh, kind of end our sole reliance on the Russians, and and by that what I mean is we want to have the ability to have crew come to station by by two dissimilar means. One would be a U.S. provider, either uh, both SpaceX and uh, and uh, Boeing would would be one of those would be both of those would be providers as well as a Russian entity. So we'd like to get to where we have essentially three means to get uh, crew to and from space station. Okay, we have one more in the room here. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Jay Patterson with CT News Junkie. Um, this is for Mike. Um, you mentioned earlier that one of the uh, cargo that was lost was an EMU. Um, how is that going to affect uh, EVA planning and uh, repairs and, and, and uh, any of that type of stuff that you have on the horizon at the moment? Um, <clears throat> well, we'll have to go look at it for certain. Uh, our plan was to bring home uh, another EMU uh, 3011, which we had removed the the pump from. Uh, so I I suspect we'll have a conversation about uh, just replacing the pump and keeping it on orbit a bit longer. Uh, we do we do have um, uh, two EMUs, three EMUs today that are operational on board. Um, and 3011, which is, doesn't have its, uh, its pump installed. And so um, given the way we've been able to uh, install uh, the pumps, uh, if we can get through this last anomaly with the pump that we just had, uh, then I suspect we'll be fine with suits for, for a while, although we would like to get uh, a couple of new units up there just because their life is getting uh, kind of long for the ones that are on over it. Okay, our next question comes from the phone from Sophie Sanchez of the Huffington Post. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for Gwen. Um, your previous launches have shared fuel tank videos um, in the tank and the liquid oxygen tank. Um, I'm assuming that was to capture some visual data regarding the behavior of liquid fuel. Um, have those videos revealed anything concerning? And was there a camera in the uh, liquid oxygen fuel tank today? Uh, the the we do have uh, video in the first stage locks tank, um, and uh, that was to help us understand the characteristics of the of the locks. Um, we did. I don't believe we had a camera in the second stage tank. Um, so, and that's the one that we're focusing the investigation on right now. Um, if uh, if we do have uh, video data from the first stage that that can give us any information, we'll obviously use it. We've got over 3,000 uh, telemetry channels to to be looking through data or to look at for data, um, including video. So, if there's a, if there's something there, we'll find it. We're going to look at everything, of course. Okay. Um, another question from the phone, Miriam Kramer from Mashable. Hi, thanks very much for taking my question. Um, this is honestly for, for anybody that knows the answer, maybe Pam or Gwen, um, but I'm wondering how large of a debris field um, you're, you're looking at now. So is there an estimate for how big it is? Um, and, uh, and that's it, thank you. I don't have an estimate for that right now. Um, I can find out from my recovery team. Pam, I'm assuming if you, if you knew one, you'd speak up. Absolutely, Gwen, and, and as this is being a, a SpaceX-led mishap investigation, I defer to whatever information you have because I don't have anything to the contrary or otherwise. Okay, we'll take one more in the room over here. 
Hi, I'm Christine Corbett Moran. I'm a postdoctoral fellow, NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics fellow at Caltech here with NASA Social. My question is for Gwen. Um, the upcoming flight abort test, would that system have saved lives in the event of an anomaly similar to today's? And will Commercial Dragon eventually have such abort capabilities to also save important commercial crew um, and uh, experiments in the future. Most definitely, the uh, the escape system uh, slated uh, for drag for the second version of Dragon would have uh, would have taken or should have certainly have taken the astronauts to uh, to a safe place uh, after an anomaly like this. Um, in fact, it. it it's designed to take uh, a far more energetic event and get the astronauts safely away. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening, this was not a first stage. Uh, for all, all indications say that this was not a first stage issue. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, the launch escape system would have been enormously helpful here for the astronauts. And I also mentioned that we did have Dragon telemetry uh, after the, uh, the event. Uh, so uh, Dragon was transmitting and uh, appears to have been healthy for at least some period of time. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have today. I want to extend a thank you to all of our panelists who took time out of um, responding to this to come talk to us about it. So thank you to Gwen Shotwell, Bill Gerstenmeyer, Michael Safradini, and Pam Underwood. And thank you to everyone who joined us in the room, on the phones, on social media, online. As appropriate, SpaceX and NASA will be providing updates on our websites and on social media. And again, and for those uh, who may find any debris, please call 321-867-2121. Again, if you find any debris, please call the hotline 321-867-2121. Two, one. You can always find all our information about the International Space Station at nasa.gov slash station. Thank you.